name is given in Um Yeah, this is quite an awkward space for me. I'm used to be on stage singing. Now I have to speak <coughs> quite a shift. Otherwise, um, yeah. You're welcome to sing if you'd like. <laughs> we, we, we're very open because LB said we must have fun at the same time as doing this. So. We'll try, we'll try. <clears throat> um, as the Department of Basic Education, I, I believe that we are on the right track. Looking at what avenues we have created for, for, a, for collaborations to actually uh, 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 take place and, and, and us making sure that um, the core business that we're dealing with, which is the learner, is the fruitful beneficiary of what our collaborations and partnerships are actually putting on the table. Uh, in 2010-11, the Minister of Basic Education, um, Mrs. Angel Mutecha, actually established a directorate which facilitates partnerships, which is actually making sure that um, the access is given to the private and the business sector in terms of wanting to collaborate with the, with the sector. And, and we are so grateful that um, we're so saying, we have seen a tremendous change in terms of the offering that the business and um, the community is giving in terms of the support towards education. Um, if I may say that we have an estimated number of 250,000 partnerships, formalized partnerships, which is a big number. Uh, I mean, looking at the, 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 the number of uh, learners that we have, 12 million, which is a huge number of learners that we have. And, and, and we are so looking forward in terms of uh, uh, more partners to be uh, formalized with the department so that we're able to reach our ultimate goal, um, where we give our learners the education that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we will we'll definitely do uh, uh, questions after that as well. Those are, those are big numbers, but that actually just puts more pressure on the situation. So, um, Roxana, we'd like to chat about some of your experiences of challenges in the sector and collaboration. Sure. Um, just for the record, I'm Roxana Rajab. Um, I am an MD of Resonance Consulting, but I am an associate of Joint Education Trust Services. And I was really honored to have been appointed as the project manager to lead a project um, in developing an association for nonprofit organizations. So we're calling it NASCI, which is the National Association for Social Change Entities in Education. Um, I have been through a series of uh, interventions, both from policy development uh, with government, uh, sat on various boards such as SACWA and the National Skills Authority, um, went into uh, the field as an implementer, uh, both as a training provider as well as an advisor. And um, I have found in my experience in all of this that in every platform that I have sat in or every conference, the conversation was always with ourselves. By that I mean, if it was something that was hosted by government, there was very few business representatives there. And so we ended up talking to ourselves as government officials and as policy makers and trying to shape policy that will transform our country. And then when I got invited to BUSA interventions, for example, Business Unity South Africa, there were no government representatives. And so I questioned this. And many times it was, well, we've invited the seaters. How many seaters are there in the room? No one. And yet the mandate of the sector education and training authorities is to work with levy payers in order to be able to take that funding, which we are not short of. We've got trillions, actually, that sit in that sector. Um, and not being utilized sufficiently. So there's a space, there's a gap. There's the corporates, and they have a need, as you heard just now from Old Mutual, to be able to have a workforce that is relevant to their industry. And you have government, and you have a large budget, as Tafang has also said earlier on, over 300 billion. Um, so it's not the money, it's the will and the drive to work together.
And so there is this gap that can be filled by nonprofit organizations who are working very hard. But I find that the trust between funders and implementers is not quite there. The relationship between them are not quite there. So this organization that we want to launch next month in May, we have a conference on the 28th and 29th, and you all are welcome to come to that conference. Um, it, it's an inaugural um, AGM uh, where we will be appointing a board of directors to become that voice for nonprofit organizations, mm. to actually talk to government and to say we are a credible stakeholder and you'll have to listen to us. Many of the NGOs work within communities. So I, I don't want to take up too much time. You can hear I'm passionate about this. Um, I think that we're ready to go. And so I'll share some of that as we go through the discussions. Thanks. Excellent. Um, David from the DG Murray Trust. Thank you. So DG Murray Trust is a private foundation. Um, uh, we've tried to sort of reshape it away from the idea of an organization that sits waiting for the post to come in and then hands out uh, the checks to, to one that sort of positions itself as um, a, uh, really a strategic, uh, a strategic investor, but, but with the identity of trying to be a public innovator. So that's, that's sort of the space that we try and occupy. Um, and, uh, you know, as we, as we think about education, and um, I'm, I wasn't here for LB's speech, but I'm sure that uh, he just alluded to, to the fact that we have such polarized outcomes in the education uh, system that if you have a look at the quality of education provision in South Africa, um, the shape of that quality curve really looks like a tortoise. We've got 20% of schools the higher quality side sitting in the head of the tortoise, and we've got 80% of schools um, that are falling under the shell of the tortoise. And, and uh, we know that this is going to take a long time to turn around. We know that uh, there, there are no uh, quick fixes, that there's a need for slow but sure and incremental imp improvement. And, and that has to be the primary responsibility of the Department of, uh, of Basic Education. It has to move the tortoise along in the right direction. Um, but somehow we need to change that shape of the animal. We need to transform that, uh, that animal so it doesn't look like a tortoise anymore. We've got to find a way to, to uh, break this deep valley, this neck of the tortoise um, that, that keeps uh, poorer kids from accessing good, uh, good education. And I think that that's where uh, partnerships are so crucial. Um, Government has a role in terms of incremental development of teachers, professional development, etc. Um, uh, the other option is to say, well, let the private sector do it and uh, simply set up uh, a private independent schools um, and start to get a drain out of the public system. Um, we know that both of those options are, are destined for disaster. Um, so we have no option but to find, uh, find a way of achieving true public-private partnership for, uh, for education. And, and I think that the role of, uh, of, um, of external parties mm -hmm. is perhaps to be able to say things and do things that government can't. And so, so, so be able to identify a, a disruptors that it's not that government hasn't seen, um, but perhaps there isn't necessarily the political will to do it, or perhaps it's just some things that they're not able or willing to do at the moment. Um, so if we're going to turn this education system around, we need children entering school able to learn. That means we have to create a groundswell from bottom up of children who have enough food, who have enough early learning to be able to get into school able to learn. That would be a massive disruptor. And, and it's one of the areas where government probably is a minority player. Shouldn't be, but is. And so I think that we need to recognize and build on uh, that, uh, uh, that collaboration that, that has provided um, uh, quite a rich and diverse network of early learning in South Africa, but not yet enough. So that's a major, a, a major disruptor. Another would be if children entered school ready to read when they go to school. We neglect early language development. We should get behind the National Reading Coalition. We should all say, wow, this is a breakthrough strategy if we get behind it. Another would be if trade unions seriously took their job in terms of professionalism of teachers and were not so concerned only about, uh, uh, about uh, worker issues, important though they are. 
Um, but if we're serious about breakthroughs in our country, we're going to have to find ways to engage with trade unions differently. Unlikely, unlikely coalitions that bring the CITES into meetings like this and, and engage. And then start thinking about other forms of, of, of collaboration, public-private partnerships that haven't been tried in the, in the public sector in South Africa, but which can, perhaps can open a third way for education. Fantastic. And then Gabriel? Greetings. Hi. So I, so I suppose I really represent research to some extent. I'm an education economist um, at the University of Stellenbosch. And um, while I was trained in economics um, after leaving uh, academics for a while, thinking it was of no use and could it change anything, um, I started a, a non-profit organization, got into a dysfunctional school governing body of a poor school, and it became quite clear to me that um, really getting back into that environment was the right place to be in terms of research because we need, um, we need a starfish approach, so really changing the lives of individual children, which often NGOs can do well, but we need systemic changes as well. And there's a point at which those two can come together um, where we learn from the starfish approach, but there's also the systemic change that's happening at the same time. And I really believe that um, there's a collaborative effort that is required at that point, that interface between what we've learned from on the ground level and then what's happening at, from a research perspective um, in terms of systemic level um, patterns that are happening in the country. Um, I've, I've had the privilege of working for um, a man named uh, Professor Safas van der Berg, uh, Berg, and uh, this, this is a, an individual who's really taught me what it means to collaborate um, from the perspective of research. And one thing that I really I, I would potentially want to bring today is that collaboration um, in research for policy relevant e evidence that reshapes how we think about our environment around schooling, around the tortoise shell that has just been described, um, is that um, it starts those collaborative efforts um, between, between the state really seeing the value of research, commissioning it, taking own ownership of it to really inform evidence-based policy. That starts a long time before that, that moment that ignites when there's this collaborative effort between researchers and the state together. It really requires building trust, um, and it takes many, many years to build trust between research um, and between the state itself, which really wants to, to use information um, to, to develop better policy. And I've seen um, Safas van der Berg uh, model this really well, just years and years of building trust um, within government, um, raising up new leaders within the state that are really educated, have fantastic, you know, excellent PhDs, mentoring young people who've come to full positions within the state, building institutional capacity, as Alvin Sachs talked about earlier. And at that point, we start to see research really starting to infiltrate and the systemic level type of analyses that we need getting into the right places. Mm -hmm.